Hello and welcome back to OT the podcast. We're here to talk about watches, time, and how to spend it. I am Andy Green. Andy Green, have you been finally replaced with a robot? Because I'm Felix Schultz 4000. <laughs> the Schultzinator. Felix, what is Felix going Schultz. down? Oh, God. Schultzinator? Schultzinator. Um, I'm currently uh, reliving my early 90s action movie fantasies, um, mm. which brings us to our next guest. <laughs> It doesn't. It? it doesn't at all. It's not Arnold. Oh God! It's not Dolph. Um, it is, in fact, two guests. First up, yeah. first up, we've got uh, a contemporary artist named Philip Toledano, f- uh-huh. followed by a sort of bit of quirky, you know, watch enthusiast collector named Mister Enthusiast. Oh, amazing! Two guests, one show. Sounds great. But do you know what, Andy? Yeah. There's a twist. What is it? It's the same person. <laughs> I always thought that was someone different. No, this no, is, same, same deal. We've, I'm rattled. It's Two-Face all over again. Um, <laughs> Andy, before we get to that, let's see what has been going on in our lives. You start. I think I will because I've got some um, some pretty some pretty big news dropped from uh, the land of Switzerland overnight, and that was uh, Oris mm-hmm. have released the new Akala 400, which we sort of saw a little while ago, in a watch. Bum, bum, bum. So they've released a new Aquas with the, the Cal 400 in it. Um, it's an Aquas with a Cal 400 in it. Amazing. Uh, we got to hang. We got to have a little play with it with the uh, the Caliber 400 Experience Kit uh, mm. prior to the release. What do you think of it, Andy? Yeah, it's cool. The colors. Uh, I took it out in the sun, took some photos, which which we'll post and link up. Mm-hmm. But the mm-hmm. the colors were really vibrant. It's, a, it's um, a, basically it's a slightly different blue. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But I think really though, it's not really about like the Aquas. It's their most commercial model, um, and it makes sense to you know to put it in there. But it's all about the it's all about that movement, as Megan Trainer uh-huh. would say. Um, <laughs> <laughs> five days power reserve. Five days, Andy Green. Uh, wow. There's some silicon stuff in there. Ten year warranty. It's not like full silicon escapement, but there's bits and bobs like higher anti magnetic, um, you know, qualities. So mm-hmm. ten year warranty, ten year service intervals. Wow. Uh, which I think, and so this watch is retailing for. So the Aquas, it's four thousand eight hundred Australian on bracelet. Mm-hmm. Uh, the regular version of that same watch with the you know the uh, Salida. 2824 version is 3100 so that's a what $1,500 premium a bit more that's not that's not good math it's 1700 but still that's not bad no it's, it, it might not be good math but it's still I think a pretty decent value proposition yeah sub 5k that's, that's like I mean if you, you, you consider so what's Tudor's under 5k so the Black Bay uh, about that, it's about five k. About five k. So, that's... are you calling this a Tudor killer, the Black Bay killer? No, I'm not. I mean, because the the Aquas is clearly a very different watch. But once mm. it gets into the uh, Diver sixty five, I think that's a different sort of. That's a very compelling proposition. So, five days PR is a solid like sales pitch number on its own. Like if I walk into a shop and someone holds up two watches, and says, well, this one, sir, has five days power reserve, and in like, an automatic has... too, right? A lot of yeah, people yeah. pointed out. Uh, the, because the movement has been released as we're recording this, yep. the watch is not it's still under embargo technically. Yep. Uh, but a lot of people were pointing out they did have a ten day power reserve on a manual. Yeah, but that's movement. a big movement. Like that's a that's a big uh, movement. A, it's like a f- big, like bigger than a Unitas, and it's really niche. And then it's you a, think it's we'll got, see this movement mm-hmm. in the other pieces? One hundred percent. That's what they're doing it for. Yeah. They've been there's there's no. It's designed to replace or to be the same size as their sort of their standard. Uh, some leader works one, um, and a, what, what's what's the percentage price? It's like twenty percent, thirty percent more. Yeah, about that. Yeah, about uh, that's, I think yeah. that's absolutely fair to pay. Like you get something that on paper is a lot better. It's it looks a little bit nicer. It's uh, good. The warranty on its own, like that's solid. Like, I mean, if that includes servicing, like if you if it has any issues, I mean, you're probably going to get it a regular Aquas service. Yeah, I don't know, one and a half times, two times in 10 years if you yeah. look after your watch. Yep. So, and that'll be, that'll probably be the difference. It'll be 700 to to $1,000 to service that watch otherwise. So, there you go. Yeah, the numbers add up. Uh, the other nice little thing I quite liked about the Aquas is that it's actually got a quick release bracelet, which is a, a nifty little addition. 
Um, so yeah, that's always good. Yeah, I think it's I think it's really good. Like I mean, the Aquas I'm, I've always been. It's a fine watch, but I mean the the integrated uh, spring bars kind of. Uh, don't excite me too much but once they start putting that movement into you know diver 65 and some of their other stuff i think it's a really really uh, i genuinely think it's one of the most exciting movement developments in the last I few mean, years and if it adds that sort of amount to the price the diver 65 is still going to be affordable because exactly. that's like a three thousand three and a half thousand dollar watch or something yeah. like that so it'll be the same it'll be like just still under five making moves the uh the team at Oris are making and, moves. Yeah, and I, and I don't, also don't think they're not planning to like phase out the other ones, but it's an option. Mm. So if you want something that's a bit more, um, a bit more prestigious and a bit more powerful, it's it's there for you. What's yeah, been, uh, you know, uh, what else is happening? Oh, we do know what we need to do, yeah. Andy. We can't keep talking. We need to have a break. <laughs> Let's do it. Let's do it. This episode of OT the Podcast is brought to you by our brand new sponsors, Long Jeans. We're excited to have them on board. And today we're talking about their new Spirit collection. The Spirit is a new line for Long Jeans, and I think it might be one of the strongest releases of 2020. The Spirit collection is inspired by legendary pioneers of air, land, and sea. People like Amelia Earhart and Howard Hughes, who both wore and use Long Jeans. But this isn't a heritage watch. It's contemporary and a little bit sporty but inspired by Longines history. Yeah, I think this is going to be a very major collection for the brand. Top line, there's three new options at the moment. A 40mm automatic, a 42mm automatic, and a 42mm chronograph. There's three colours in the Spirit collection, which are white, black, and blue. All the models have a five-year warranty, chronometer certified automatic movements with 60 hours of power reserve and 100 metres of water resistance, and a range of strap and bracelet options. There's even a prestige edition where you get a strap, bracelet and a cool leather nato all in one and all those straps are quick release which is nice absolutely we'll be getting some time with these watches really soon but felix you actually saw them when they were released earlier this year yeah i had a, I had a chance to check them out a few months ago and i've got to say i was really impressed with the offering the proportions and design are really smart and they're well finished i personally loved the 40 millimeter automatic what i really liked about it and, and the whole collection in fact was the dial they're rich and textured and they punch well above their weight, so to speak. The center section has a really pleasing grain. You can see it most clearly on the white model. It adds some, some richness and some extra oomph. I also liked the applied hour markers and hands. They've got a slightly vintage, mid-century vibe to them. There's other nice touches on the dial to dive into as well, like the little recessed diamond-shaped lozenges on the chapter ring and that five-star detail just above six. That's a nod to some vintage Longines models. Very cool. I love a bit of extra oomph and I love the look of the blue dial. Can you tell me what the pusher at 10 does on the chronograph? That is actually a quick set date, which is quite handy. Absolutely. Now let's talk about the price. The time only spirit comes in two sizes, 40, which is $3,200 Aussie dollars on leather or brace, bracelet and 42 millimeters, which is 3350 on leather or bracelet. If you dig in the chrono, that's going to be forty six fifty on leather or bracelet. Now those prestige editions we mentioned, it's forty one fifty for the forty millimeter auto and forty three twenty five for the forty two millimeter auto. Andy, that's a lot of numbers. But who's this watch for? It's an all day, every day timepiece, so I can see it suiting anyone and any occasion seamlessly. A particularly tempting choice that's great value as we enter Australian summer. The pioneer spirit lives on. Head to longjeans.com to discover the collection today and buy it online. We'll link it up in the show notes. Now, time to get back to the show. What's been going on with you, Andy? What have you been up to? All righty. I have about a week ago now, two weeks ago probably, I published my first article, my uh, my maiden. Your debut. Your debut. My debut over, over at the uh, Collected Man <sighs> Journey. Yeah. <laughs> no one calls it the Collected Man Journey. No, you Collected Man Journal. You cut me oh, off. You said Jern. I was like... Oh, no, journal. Just, I mean, oh. just uh, going to go write my journal. <laughs> Scribble some notes down. Uh, well, they you... sell a lot of Jean, so <laughs> maybe I'll do a Jean piece in my journal. What did you write um, in your journal? I wrote an article called Race to the Bottom, Rolex and Omegas Fight Over Comex. Really? Tell me more. I will. You helped a little bit, a teeny amount, but it was a lot of research, a lot of <laughs> I, reading, I think a lot I of provided interviews. That, um, do you know how they say that genius is 99% perspiration, 1% inspiration? Yeah, yeah. I was the inspiration. So if, if we had to put this into sports, I was sort of I was like Rocky running along, uh -huh. and you was you were the trainer, sort of like just in the car, sort of spitting 
uh, motivation at me, like, yeah, keep going. You can do this. You can do this. Because this was a 3,000 word article. This was a big boy and it was yeah. longer than 3,000. There were definitely uh, periods where you were like, you were, you were feeling it. You were like, Rocky, you, you, wanted, to, you wanted to just tap out. But I yelled, hard, I yelled at you. Hard. I told you not to. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, like I, you know, there's, it's not every day you do an article where you kind of you spend 90 greatest. minutes on the phone with, uh, you know, the head of the museum of, uh, of Omega. So thank you, Petros. Appreciate your time. Uh, but yeah, it basically explored both brands' relationship with Comex and the sort of watches that were were birthed. Uh, so yeah, go check that out. We'll link it up. What was, uh, been, uh, no spoilers, but what was the, um, what did Omega do? Like, I think everyone knows, sort of knows Comex and, and Rolex, but what did Omega do with um Comex. Yeah, so it was the sort of the variations on the Seamaster, if you will. So the Ploprof uh, one and the zero and sort of those two sort of varying prototypes and obviously the Ploprof as we know it today. And, you know, on Rolex's side, it was, you know, the focus on predominantly the sea dweller with a little bit of Well, I mean, who, who, who knew, A, Omega and Comex and B, that there was more than one sort of Ploprof? I'm learning stuff already, Andy Green. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, that's, uh, that's something I've been liking, my own. Your own stuff. Work. Do you, want to know some, do you want to know uh, what I've been liking? Yeah, hit me. A little bit of Andy love. I've been liking your oh. new watch. Oh, <laughs> which one? The the Halios. Yes, the Halios. Which one? Oh, Andy, so good. Andy, which watch green? Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, tell us about so that. Good. I've been, yeah, you've been, um, you know. Often. I've not been this excited for a watch in quite some time. It's and it's because it's been, it was one of those, It's <laughs> it's been one of those pre-order pieces. So the the hype and the build up and the updates that come via email of sort of production. And Jason over at Halios is really good oh, at sort of that side of customer service of like, Hey guys, I just got, you know, the cases in and I'm personally just going updates. So, so when did, like, when did you know you were going to get one? How long ago? Um, like what's the, how long's this months. journey been? No, no, it's been months. It's been, it's been one of the longer waits. Okay. Uh, Aside from Rolex. Rolex guys, which I'm still waiting <laughs> on. Uh, but it's been a long wait. It's been a pretty long wait. Yeah. Uh, I think it's been like four or five months. I lose track. Uh, but I went for the new Helios Fairwind mm-hmm. with the slate gray sort of mock-up. I went the Sapphire 12-hour bezel, mm-hmm. which I love. I love the watch. The case is banging. It's 39 millimeters. So the proportions are just lovely. And the lugs especially, like there's so much detail. And what I love about Helios is... They put in, I mean, it's Jason, but they put in so much work and I really do outclass sort of the category that they play in. But like the the lugs have like polished chamfering on them, which yeah. you just don't see at a watch that's like 800 US dollars. It's crazy. Like that's, yeah. It's like he's paying you that amount of money to take the watch and then, you know, who the knows question, how much I mean, I, I 100% agree. Like, I mean, he's, he's clearly, he loves what he does and he really pays attention yeah. to the details, but you look at this watch and you look at it and you go, why can't other brands, some of them large Swiss producers, do this? Like if yeah. if basically one guy in Canada who gets on the phone to, you know, some factories can do it for that price. Love. Or maybe he's, you know, making no money on it. Maybe that's the answer. Um, no, no, I think he's, I think he does all right. He's got a, there's a hype around it. There's yeah. a really big fan base. One thing I want to touch on is the, the dial has a heap of details. And the second thing is the bi-directional bezel, which after doing a massive Comex piece where they kind of explored, you know, bezel locks and unidirectional bezels, the bi-directional is actually like really fun. I'm not kidding really? myself. I'm not taking it diving. It's got I this bi-directional, like, it was super bi-directional. smooth. Yeah, like, yeah. Is it it's ratcheted or ratchet. is it just like free? No, it's ratcheted, but like yeah. a smooth ratchet. It's sort nice. of nice. Like, like a pop. Like, like a, a little like pop. Like a, a fine rather than a... No, smoother than that. Try it again, wow. but smoother. <laughs> Yeah, okay. yeah, we're nearly there. We're nearly there. Halios owners will know, but I love it because when you post to Halios, people, all of the Halios owners, well, do you have it? Do you have it handy? Is it, or is it in the other room? No, it's in the other room. Uh, I was going to get some. I'm wearing mic. something else. I was going to get some on mic bezel action. Just to... oh, I can, we can edit it in. I'll do this after. I'll run off and get it. And we can edit it in. Okay, sure. Uh, right. I don't know if that'll actually happen. Um, well, it's happening now. Okay, all right. Well, I think we all right, need we should to... get. Well. You go. We should get one of our guests on the phone. Yeah, let's do it. Andy, today's guest, uh, we've already hyped him up enough. It is none other. None other. I, he's got me lost for words. Philip Toledano. He's a British photographer living in New York City, just like Sting. He's an artist who works across mediums from photography to installation and I suspect everything in between. He deals a lot with socio-political themes, but Andy, he has another name. 
Yeah, you guys might know him uh, by the moniker Mr. Enthusiast, which is where he gets up to the uh, the mischief on the daily. Um, and uh, as Felix said, Philip, great to have you on the on the line. Well, thank you so much for having me, geezers. <laughs> Matt, <laughs> just from one geezer to another, it's 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 great to uh, it's great to chat. And uh, so, as Felix mentioned, we found you in New York, and you know, I think. Leading into this chat, we mentioned we want to talk uh, about a range of things. We want to talk about, you know, Mr. Enthusiast, obviously, because that's sort of the the watch and the car side of, of your life. But also, you know, in a, in a professional sense, I think it's probably the the more boring side of you to um, to kick out the way. But but who are you and what do you do? <laughs> and how much do you make? Show me a tax return. Uh, <laughs> Where did you go to school? <laughs> I always find that's an amazing icebreaker if you're at a dinner party. <laughs> It's actually genius. <laughs> next time you sit down dinner and you sit next to a stranger, just, just to say, so, you know, what do you make just per annum? And that's an amazing <laughs> gauge of how, w- whether there's a sense of humor happening or not. <laughs> I, it's a, wow. So, um, well, I guess um, I was, I used to work in advertising for a long time. I was an art director mm-hmm. and a creative director. Um, and at some point I got tired of listening to myself moan about wanting to be an artist or a photographer. (laughs) So I quit um, slash got fired to to become a, (laughs) that's another story. So uh, I I started as a photographer and, and, and now I guess if I want to sound like a pompous ass, which I do, then I say I'm a conceptual artist because for me, everything Mm -hmm. kind of revolves around the idea of an idea. Okay. okay. That's... Was that a conversation <laughs> stopper? <laughs> Was that it? Yeah, Thank I think. I think the pod- how much do you make? <laughs> yeah, and that the draws the conclusion. Done. Our interview. <laughs> but, Explain what you mean, or not? Uh, well, I guess. I, I mean, I, I guess I, I, I could talk briefly about a couple of the projects. For instance, um, yes, during the dot com collapse in America in the in, the, in two thousand. I did a I did a book that was called Bankrupt, which was photographs of bankrupt offices and the things that people had left behind in the offices. So it was sort of like economic archaeology. Oh, that's uh, so cool. So, so that that was the first book. Um, then I did a book on on I was really interested in the idea of plastic surgery because I'm obviously an old geezer now and I'm, I'm seriously considering it. Uh, I was just <laughs> interested in the idea of people reinventing themselves and what and how people went about that. So I did a book called A New Kind of Beauty. Um, I did a book called Maybe, uh, that's my most recent book, where um, I sort of envision all the worst possible things that might happen to me in the next 40 or 50 years based on conversations with fortune tellers and tarot card readers and numerologists. And I worked with a, pla- uh, a prosthetics expert, a, a special effects expert who m- made me up in like latex effects, which took four or five hours. And I'd live as this future version of myself because I was really interested in, in knowing my future. <laughs> so, huh. and i've done a lot of political stuff because i'm a i'm a bit of a yeah. left political lefty commie bastard um mm. so i did a during the sort of the bush years i did a project called america the gift shop and the idea was if american foreign policy had a gift shop what would they sell and then what I, would they in, sell? well <laughs> well for instance i made a i made a uh a, a snow globe which had Dick Cheney in it shredding top secret documents. And when you shook the snow globe, all these shredded bits of document floated around the snow globe. Uh, What would would the gift shop sell today? Oh God. So, I mean, I'm actually doing a project in the globe. (laughs) You would actually see Trump in the globe. I'm actually doing a project about what's happening now. Um, It's on two projects at the moment, right? Uh, you, well, one's kind of done. This one is it's still going. Um, but I don't know if you, in Australia, if you get this, but in the States, everyone's always talking about the deep state. Um, oh, we get them. And the deep state sort of after, you know, it's, it's this, this sort of shadow state that's out to get Trump and, and, and eviscerate his, his government and, and bring him down, basically. So I kept hearing that. And I thought, what if the deep state is actually a state like New York State, Virginia State, <laughs> the deep state? It's a real place. And in the deep state exist all the kind of fears and paranoias and conspiracy theories. They're all real things. So it's a road trip through this fictitious place. (laughs) Yeah, I've got some suspicions as to where this might be, but I don't think I'll I'll go there. Um, Yeah. I think think, think it is a real place. Um, Well, it is for for the people. I mean, that's the thing. the, The thing that started me thinking about it was that when... Trump talks about America, and even when he was running for office, he was talking about it in such 
he was living in America, describing an America that I was not living in. It sounded like mm. a totally different country. And for people who believe in everything he's saying, who believe the conspiracy theories and, and QAnon and all the rest of it, all that's as real to them as the America that I live in is, real, is as real to me. So I found it interesting, this idea of making it a real tangible place you could look at. I've been looking at pictures of uh, United States Navy pilots' helmets. Ah, oh. that's right. Well, um, talk to me. Talk to me. What are we looking at here? Talk to me, Goose. <laughs> Come on. I had you can to. always be my wingman, man, <laughs> Mr. Enthusiast. <laughs> nice man. Uh, um, well, I, I've always, I mean, you know, because I'm like a weapons grade nerd, there's, uh, there's nothing that I'm not really interested in, but I've always been mm. sort of fascinated with military stuff and, you know, jet mm-hmm, fighters. Mm-hmm, and, mm-hmm. and years ago, I did a, a, a black and white project on air shows. So I was, I was, um, I was poking around the web looking for an ejector seat to buy, as one does, sure. as you do after after you have a, after you had dinner, a few uh, wines, you cut a couple of goblets of wine. Like you know what would be yep. good, an ejector seat. <laughs> so, sure. so, and then I come across this this website with this. this he's this guy yeah. selling military ephemera, and he's got these fighter pilot helmets, and they're just I've never seen anything like it. And I and I start getting into it. And I, what I discover is basically, and there was a very sort of, there was a tiny window of time from the maybe the early 70s to mid 70s, uh, which is pretty soon into the beginning of the jet age, 20 or so years into mm. the beginning of the jet age, when US Navy fighter pilot helmets specifically could decorate their pilot, their helmets any way they saw fit, just as long as they used reflective tape. So, yeah, okay. Uh, What's cool is that they, they, they look like, a lot of them just look like these like contemporary modern art. And they're really beautiful. And, and, they're, and what's cool about them is that, so I, then I started you know, trying to buy as many as I could lay my damp hands on. And what's cool about them is that they're, they're, the patina on the helmets, they're sort of scratched and, and you know, scuffed and, and faded and, and some of the stickers mm. have come off. But, but they're so beautiful. And, and, I, and I'm really into, there's something lovely about stumbling across a little pocket of history that has sort of gone unnoticed for 20 or 30 years. Yeah, and I think that's, you know, I can see why you're into watches and and everything else because there's that sort of, um, what's the word? I don't know. I want want to say... Nerdery? Well, yeah. I mean, like, like, uh, what do you like about them? Because there's, I, I, you know, there's that, there's a a deep function to them, but there's also... Elements of something that, like, well, there's an aesthetic. aesthetic. Well, you're actually, you know what, you're 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 actually right. In in some ways, and this is a weird comparison I've not thought about, but it's similar to my love for Group B cars. Like, they were built for a functional reason, but they're kind of weirdly beautiful in their functionality, and that's exactly what happened to these fighter pilot helmets. They're super functional, but then on overlaid on that is this kind of beauty that managed to sprout in the heart of the American military, where you think it would sprout yeah and I, I think layered on top of that and again with group b cars there's that sort of very masculine uh fetishization of danger and stuff that we probably shouldn't have that's ex- you saying with. i have a tiny penis is that what you're saying felix uh, no <laughs> have you just no, co- no, just I come was... out and say it man andy can we just take a break i need a refill what are you drinking felix yeah classic filter roast from our new coffee sponsor inglewood coffee roasters beverage sponsor felix we have made it I've got a cheeky Jürgen Chef filter on the go at the moment. Ethiopian bean with some light floral notes. It's my daily, and I can't get enough. Well, Felix, I'm actually punching out another double espresso using their Colombian Spirit of Peace Espresso Roast Blend. It's sweet and biscuity. So here's the deal. Use OT30, that's OT30, for 30% off your order at checkout. On top of that, Inglewood Coffee Roasters offer free shipping on all Victorian orders and Australia-wide when you spend more than $50. Head to inglewoodcoffeeroasters.com.au to place an order today. We'll link that up. OT the podcast, fueled by... Inglewood Coffee Roasters. Let's get back. <laughs> Mr. Enthusiast reveals all. Yeah. You actually, that's exactly right, Felix, because the Thank thing you. I love about Group B cars is I, it was the proximity to romance, right? I could buy an, a Lancia 037, and even though I drive like a, like a you know, half-blind mole, um, mm. it's, I'm still, it's still that romanticism, being in a car that was sort of more or less designed for this incredible race that I always loved as a kid. And that's the same with the fighter pilot animals. You have this thing that 
you know, these guys wore in these fighter planes and they're so, and to have, to be able to touch an object like that for me is super cool. Mm. Love it. And and what I think is really evident through the, the start of this chat is, you know, you are an artist and you've got this, um, you're very educated, very intelligent. Um, and you have Extremely. this old school. Yeah, you can tell, you can tell. And <laughs> you have this sort of, I, I don't want to call it old school, but like the the right way of sort of approaching art. And, and, and you can hear it through the way you invest time, money, researching. Uh, it's, it's meticulous the way that you approach art. And again, as Felix says, we see this through the way you collect watches, uh, and and cars and that sort of thing. But before we before we move on to that, I want to wrap on the out and I want to hear about you know obviously a lot of the um, a lot of your work is photography and that's a, a a subject that is you know really interesting in itself. But I'm keen to hear what you think is important in photography and how you use it to uh, use it within your art. Well, I mean, actually, if you look at if I would say maybe half the stuff I've done or maybe a little under that is, is actually photography and the rest yeah. is sculpture or painting or video. Um, so the thing, here's the thing I say, but it's, it, I'm not, uh, I had this kind of revelation um, maybe 10 or 15 years ago that, that I was really interested in ideas. And I realized that for me, ideas are kind of like sentient beings. They're like living creatures. And when you have an idea, it will tell you what it wants to be. It will tell you what form it wants to take. And when I had this kind mm-hmm. of epiphany, it was it was incredibly liberating because I suddenly realized, oh, I don't have to stuff this idea into a photograph. I can make it an oil painter. I can make it a bronze sculptor. I can make it a video. And that was really liberating to realize that. So, so, and if you look at the photography stuff I've done, every stylistically, it's each project is different. Like the project about my dad has a very different feel than the project than say the fighter pilot helmets because that's mm-hmm. what that project demanded. Was that an answer or is that a total ramble? <laughs> no, no. I think it, it makes... I wanted to know like about exposure and focus. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and how many I'm likers actually, you use. Cause... I'm, actually, I'm, a not, I'm a not a like a geezer. I find the whole kind of Instagram like a fetish thing and this whole like it always like all these people post a picture, you know, F2, 160th of a second, 200 ISO. You know, like I just think as a guy who grew up with film, I just see no reason to... to 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 mat to fiddle around with film anymore. So you don't use film at all? No, not for years. Interesting. Because it's a pain in the ass. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it what really would you is. shoot it's on? A massive, it's a massive pain in the ass. I have a Sony uh, A7 with some Zeiss okay. lenses, and then I've got a uh, a Contax medium format camera that I, that I had when I was shooting film with a digital back on the back of it. Okay. Okay. Good answer. All right. Um, very interesting. All right. So as we said, most people know you as, as Mr. Enthusiast, a, um, uh, a wild, uh, wild character running around Instagram, um, causing, causing a ruckus. Now we look at, you know, look at your, look at your feed and look at the, the pieces that you collect in some other interviews. You've got very individual, um, I'll call them individual watch tastes, tastes. And it, it's pretty clear you're sort of carving your own segment. And, and that means sort of, Lots of rarity, um, lots of quirk, things like, uh, you know, old Patek, uh, old, you know, beta movements, lots of old Rolex chronographs, um, you know, pre-Daytona stuff. What draws you to those segments and, and those pieces and how do you sort of, how do you find um, such high quality in, in such obscure corners of, you know, the watch market? Well, well uh, first of all, I'm, a, I'm an amazing ferreter if that's a word, like I'm really, <laughs> <laughs> I just really ferret around into sort of dusty nooks and crannies. And, and there's, there's, I mean, there's such a joy to hunting down um, weird, obscure watches. But I, I think to answer the first part of your question, um, I'm interested, I'm really fascinated with the idea of collecting on Instagram because I find that, I think really strongly that collecting should always reflect who you are. And I find more often than not, when you look at people's watches it seems to reflect who everyone else is and i don't i don't really understand uh-huh. that like why would you why would you want to have the same you go to the like the watch sausage yeah. party what do you want to have the same watch as everyone else for and it's not about money it's just about an an an, an, an expression of who you are so it doesn't mean by that by that i'm not saying you have to spend like 50 grand on a watch you could spend uh, you know 500 bucks on a watch i've got these seikos that i love that are just incredibly hard to find and they cost me 500 bucks and i mm. love those watches because they're really beautiful and 
I won't see many people wearing them. They cost five hundred bucks before you bought them. <laughs> but then you, like, I, it's a it's a bit of a phenomenon where you post like a quirky watch. You know, it's a, a quirky IWC or a quirky Seiko, and all of a sudden I just see comment upon comment of where did you where you where you buy this? Are you selling this? I, you know, I, I totally I screwed myself though because I posted the thing about this Omega watch from this, the the eighties, and I had had my eye on the same watch on eBay, and after my post, it was gone. And I was, so I, yeah, sure. I sort of, it was a, it was premature posting. So awkward. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's, I want to talk about the eighty stuff, but I, I I do think it's really interesting what what sort of Andy and you are saying about you know collecting and that mentality because. I think it also, you know, the fact that you're going, yep, I am into two-tone Rolex princes from the 40s while everyone else is after, you know, steel sports. It, right. it takes some sort of self-confidence to know what you <laughs> like <laughs> and to not, wow, you, 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 you know, like whereas other people are like, oh, what, what's everyone else collecting? Oh, they're all collecting this. I'm going to go there. Whereas you can see something in the, in the corner of the catalogue and go, actually, no, that's that's kind of funky. What's going on there? I think that's a... A, well, a don't get me wrong. Of, I'm not. I'm not, yeah. I'm not immune to the. I'm not immune to the sort of forces of. Uh, like I've got a, a mm. Rolex sub and I've got a Daytona. You know, <laughs> so I'm certainly out. not immune sure. to the. Sure. Yeah, to, I'm a full sellout. But well, I mean, when I was in advertising, but, a guy I worked for called me a pathological contrarian, and when he said yep. that, I was like, "Oh shit, you're so right. I had no idea, but you're <laughs> totally right." <laughs> no, I'm not. Walking contradiction. You're a walking contradiction, but. What what I what to add to Felix's point as well is that you know a lot of the pieces that you have are rare to the point that there's not much info out there on them. And at first glance, you might say, "Oh, that's a that's an old Rolex chronograph, or that's an old Patek Beta 21." But like if you if you're like me and you kind of go, oh, "I haven't seen many of these before," and it takes you on a rabbit hole of kind of researching, you realize there's not a lot out there especially not online there's there's not many of them out there so in terms of actually like purchasing and and buying into these sorts of areas it's actually i would say it's a, it's a riskier um place to be just because of the lack of info lack of you know pieces to compare a lot of these are you know genuine you know auction pieces because it's the only place you can get it or from you know a very small group of dealers so well you're quite the right research but- well, the, but the, to, to the contrary to that, the, the, the bonus of that is, because there's not a lot out there, is that no one really is bothering to make fakes of them <laughs> because yeah, no one yeah. wants them. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's yeah, not like a Daytona yeah. or a sub where there's a million people out there who are clamoring to get their hands on a, you know, whatever it is, a 5513 gloss style, whatever, blah, 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 yeah, etc. Right. right? But but for the Patek Beta 21, no one's really going, you know what? There's a huge market Beta 21 lovers out there. Well, on the flip side, there's not a, is there a huge demand? I mean, obviously after you post uh, those lovely shots of it, it, demand goes through the roof, but is there, do you ever, do you ever, you know, buy a piece like that, which, you know, is not in, in insignificant purchase and kind of ever think, well, if I need to sell this, this is going to be tricky, but I, I don't care. Like, I'm curious about the mindset because it is, oh, and, time, and maybe not man. for that because they're, they're glorious, but for the more funky stuff where it's like, oh, what have I just done? Like, this is, I've just bought the watch. <laughs> no, 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 all the time. It, uh, you're absolutely right, man. All the time. I mean, I, especially if I buy something expensive and I immediately shit my pants <laughs> and then sure. I have to, which is, you know, which is a regular occurrence. Now I'm past 50, but <laughs> it's, it's, there's a, <laughs> yeah, all the, I mean, I, look, I mean, even with the, the pre the Rolex pre Daytona stuff, I mean, look, it's not like yeah. I'm a pioneer on those watches. There's plenty of other people who've got incredible collections and are way more, mm. you know, scholarly than I am about that stuff. But even that stuff is not very fungible. Like it's not very liquid. Uh, mm. So yeah, I, th- I think about it all the time. I mean, I, I, collecting stuff is kind is a is a real privilege and a luxury, right? So I kind of and I, this always applied to cars too. Whenever I bought something or whenever I buy something, I always buy it. I buy it number one because I love it. But a, but there's always a part of my brain that goes, okay, if you had to sell it, how hard would that be to, to get rid of? Smart. And I no, want to. It's, it's get, good to have those rules of collecting. Yeah, I want to get your answer on um, '80s watches, which you've been, as we said, hyping up on Instagram. All those <laughs> yeah. funky two-tone tantalum gold marine master bloody Amigas. And we yeah. IWCs. What makes that period of watch design so great? And well, is it? Oh, uh, follow-up no, question before you've answered it. 
And I want to know specifically, like, do you think that we're about to crest a wave of the 80s watches are cool again? Well, just to refer back to me being a pathological contrarian, the reason mm-hmm. I'm looking at 80s and 70s per tech is because I'm always, whenever, like, I get, I don't like to look where everyone is looking. And whenever, ever, whenever everyone, and it seems like everyone's looking at steel sport Rolexes, I, then I think, well, what's, what's behind it and what's in front of it that no one's looking yep. at? So that's why I end up looking at Patek. But the 80s, I feel like that's really overlooked. And I just started thinking, I just started looking because I was really interested to see what was there. Um, mm. and, and I will say, I feel like the, the 80s design has real optimism to it. Like if you look at the best of like those weird Omega things and the Seiko Jujaro and all that kind of stuff, there's real kind of, it's very futuristic. And, mm. and there's and there's no, like, you look at stuff now, I feel like so much stuff now is anachronistic. Like, it's looking back at the 50s or the 40s, right? 100%. A lot of stuff. Whereas the 80s stuff seems so full of hope about, oh, we're going to be, you know, 10 years from now, everyone's going to be in jetpacks or whatever it is. <laughs> Flying cars. Uh, and I, I think yeah. you can sort of, you can extract that on two levels. So you can look at the the society of the time and, you know, where that sort of, broadly speaking, thinking like the 80s were optimism for the future. Um, less these yeah. days, but also you can look at it as a, from a strength of design, you know, I think in a lot of ways, it must be harder to be a watch designer today because you're sort of shackled by having to always reference the past. Whereas I think there was a freedom to the 80s stuff. I think you're right, man. I think that, that there's a, in all, in the best of the 80s stuff, there's this very definitive, um, 80s aesthetic which i think is really cool and and i'm um, um, are we on for like a tsunami of interest in the 80s well i think i don't know i mean i think that um i think it's a bit problematic for a lot of watch people because they don't like quartz i mean for me i don't care about the quartz or the movement so much i'm just really mostly interested in the design of it all uh, mm. and and not liking quartz is just an, an an irritating bad habit that everyone has acquired because people before yeah, them didn't like quartz and people before them didn't like quartz. So you have to not like quartz in the same way that everyone likes Rolex sports. So you have to like Rolex sports. Yeah. Uh, but the moment more people, like a lot of people start liking quartz and everyone will suddenly like quartz again. I think we're there. I think, you know, Cartier's big release this year is the Pasha. That's, yeah. you know, I think we're going to see a lot more of it. Uh, it was both. Weirdly enough, it was both at the same time. They didn't distinguish. They did quartz, oh, annual calendars, and uh, mechanical ones in the same. Well, look you know, at the time. look at the FP Journe Elegante. <laughs> <laughs> I mean that that watch is mental. That watch is super yeah. cool, and because it's FP Journe, he's sort of you know he's sort of gilded a turd in terms of the quartz movement, and he's just sort of added some zesty new features to it. But it's still a quartz watch, and people love it. Mm. I mean, you can't, can't get, get them. Those. Yeah, cannot get those. That's that happened almost sort of I, 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 in a blink of an eye. It was sort of F. P. Jean was uh, a brand that was sort of reasonable in terms of being able to pick up, and then yeah, that was eleven know. grand that watch. And even actually, yeah. it was eleven grand, and then and then it was for three or four months ago, it was fifteen grand, now and it's now it's that, right? thirty grand. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's nuts. nuts. It's nuts. Yeah, yeah that is nuts. Bloody hell, watch no, you yeah, guys, uh, get it together. <laughs> you guys are crazy. Um, what is your favorite watch from the eighties? Well, the, the Seiko, uh, Giugiaro. <laughs> I love saying that. <laughs> you know who Giugiaro was? He was a really famous car designer who designed a bunch of others. He did, I mean, he did the BMW M1. He did the Fiat Panda. Um, I did, he did the Integrale, I think too. Uh, but he designed this watch. It was worn by Ripley in Aliens. So it's known mm. as the Ripley watch, uh. the silver one. Uh, and then I've got to go with the IWC uh, Ocean Bund because it's just it's such That's a nice watch. Know, just, Aren't yeah, you selling just, that right now? Because I have two <laughs> of them. Okay. It'll be yeah. sold it's by It's my the time favorite watch up. and it's for sale on my Instagram right now. <laughs> 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 into my I DM. love that watch. I would, I would never part with it, but it's actually for sale. No, I've got two, so I'm getting rid of one of them because I'm, you know whatever it just this seems dumb to have two uh but i i think that's just, i just think that's such a cool watch yeah that's cool they, they are cool it's um it, it looks great and, and and we'll link it up if it's it, i'm sure it'll be sold by the time we even finish this chat now 
speaking uh, speaking of watches, you mentioned you have a Submariner, and as you know, we had another we had another geezer on. Um, it's one of those things where how do you, how do you become a full time engraver? Who who how is this a job in in twenty twenty? But to see him um, killing it is awesome. But obviously, you guys uh, worked on uh, a project together, the the Submariner. We've yeah. heard his side, but but <laughs> what's your side of the story? Because we know he engraved well, it. I, but, I, you know. I what did you do? Like, hey. What did you bring to the table? <laughs> <laughs> well, I called up. I was like, "Hey, man! I thought what you said was he. Uh, what was where was all that come from?" He's like, "Oh, I don't know what I said." <laughs> <laughs> so I had had this idea for like two years, and the idea was this. So I'd been looking at engraved Rolexes for a while, and and I sort of appreciated the quality of the engraving, the craftsmanship, but I found that they were just there was no, it, it wasn't interesting. Like I looked and go, "Okay, that's cool engraving," but it wasn't interesting to me. So I had this idea. Um, and the idea was this, that I would design dials that were specific to the function of the watch. And I would do a series cool. of them. So, for instance, a Rolex Sub would get an underwater-themed dial, and a Rolex Air King would get an aviation-themed dial, mm-hmm. etc. cetera. Um, and I spent two years emailing uh, engravers on <laughs> Instagram. I've mean, got this idea, and then I sent them. I had found this kind of this image of the – because I wanted to do the the, the – the old timey diver, diver wrestling the octopus. So I, I had mm-hmm. this picture and I would send it to them. I said, this is what I want to do. And no one was interested, <laughs> not a single person. <laughs> I find so, that surprising. Yeah, I mean, I thought here's, a, in, here's an idea no one's done. It, it's, a, it's a real concept and you can do a series of them. And then finally, I, I sort of came across Johnny's stuff. And I thought, holy shit, this guy's really good. So I emailed Johnny and he was like, yeah, yeah, I, let's, I, I like that idea. Let's do it. So, uh, so we did it. And then funnily enough, once he'd done the dial, I, I, I thought it'd be cool on a brass dial. So I had a brass dial made. I sent it to Johnny. He engraved it. And then I got the dial back and I popped it into the Rolex. And I thought, oh, that looks like shit. <laughs> not the dial itself, but, <laughs> but, but not, not the dial itself, but it didn't work with the watch. So then I had to go down this crazy rabbit hole because I'm a guy who like doesn't want to touch the watch, right? But all of a sudden, I thought, you know what? I have to sand. I sandblasted the watch. I made a sterile bezel. I put a black diamond in the pip. I got. I skeletonized the hand. So I did all this other stuff to the watch, and then it all kind of worked together. Um, so. And you did six. We did six. We sold four, which was shocking. Um, and we, we've got another two lined up I for uh, different watches. Different watches. Oh, I mean, still, Ro- still, still Rolex, but different, different uh, models, which I can't reveal. <laughs> I think did you reveal it just five minutes? We won't ago tell when anyone. Talked about the different themes. No, that was just casual. I just casual oh, okay, 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 okay. I was, just, I was cool, casually cool, cool. throwing out, you know, Spoiler, different models. Just, yeah, gotcha. <laughs> um, another sort of keeping it in the in the the sort of the Rolex family, uh, a watch that people might have noticed on your feed was a very well-worn looking Tudor P01, a lovely new watch that you have um, savaged, plasticized, damaged yeah. a little bit. <laughs> well, okay. So that was, you know, that that's actually fascinating. The whole Tudor P01 thing is interesting because when that was announced at, at Baselworld, um, it was like a bloody orgy of watch rage from all across the internet. That's a really and, good description. And I was, and I was, but I was so interested. I was fascinated because everyone was just upset that it wasn't another minor, another watch that looked exactly like all the other watches that Tudor was putting out. Do you know what I mean? It wasn't yeah. it supposed to be like a Submariner with like a yeah. yeah, know, yeah. Like well, they would have, they would have been upset if it was a watch that was like all the other watches they were putting out. So I don't think you can win. You can't please the internet. Well, no, because people were expecting some version of another of another traditional Tudor sub. And then they came out with this thing, which I thought was a super audacious move. And everyone mm. was really upset about it. But to me, I just saw it and I, I really loved it immediately. I thought it was super cool. Uh, but the problem I had with it is it just, I think that the people at Tudor, like they had a, they sat down at a conference table, like, yeah, we've got to put this posh strap on because you know, they, I think they were nervous about it. So that's why they put that kind mm. of leather strap on to sort of mitigate mm. the tool watchness of it. Mm. Um, so you didn't anyway, like the, it, just to be clear, for people that didn't know this, you liked it enough and you actually bought yourself one? A brand new. No, the, miss, the, the missus gave me one for Crimbo. Ah. Oh, wow. So you've, you've done that to a, but oh. Did oh, you get approval first? She, yeah, she, she's, she says, oh, this is great. I'll give you this watch and this is what you do. <laughs> she was not very happy about it, it has to be said. 
But yeah, so okay. like, she gave it to me a crimbo, and then and I had been, and I'd always felt like it would be the watch would be perfect if it just looked like it was really if it had been lived in. Mm-hmm. So then I started. Then at some point it was in the I guess it was the beginning of the pandemic. I had a little bit of time on my hands, so I thought, you know what, I'm just going to give this watch the savaging it deserves. <laughs> so, and and how how did it start? Yeah. Well. <laughs> So I, I made a video of me like rubbing the watch, the steel front of the watch against the concrete edge of the concrete countertop and just, and, and I posted on Instagram and oh, I got so many messages going just enraged and outraged people. Um, and then, but I sort of committed to it. So I, I sort yep. of, I, I, I destroyed the cape. Well, I didn't destroy it, but I just made it look really old. And I'd never done any of this before, which, and that was kind yeah, of sure. exciting too. Um, and then once the case looked really old, I thought, you know, I've got to do the dial. And I, re- I you, if you Google like how to make a dial tropical, there's endless amounts of things. But basically, the upshot seemed to be you put it in the oven. Mm-hmm. So, so I went to a watchmaker. He took the dial and the hands out, and I put it in the oven for maybe like an hour and a half. And I kept checking, and nothing was happening, and I got really depressed. So well, I went did you put it in? Your, did, you, did you take it out and then put take it home and put them in your oven? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, okay, so there wasn't yeah. a, a qualified watchmaker overseeing this. You were just most watchmakers don't have ovens in the, um, the workshop. <laughs> oh, yeah. Maybe it's, uh, maybe some sort of fancy ceramics little. <laughs> <laughs> His oven was ready for the Rolex stars that he was baking. So. Ooh. <laughs> oh, <laughs> and here's here are some fresh scones. We'll yeah. link him up in the show notes. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, it's Murray's so, bagels. That's where you went. <laughs> yeah, so, so I put it in the oven. Nothing happened. So I got really depressed. I went to play a game of Fortnite as one does. Nice. And then as I was playing, I thought, you know what? Maybe I should put it on broil instead of bake. <laughs> and, <laughs> which I don't know why I thought that, but it just seemed to make sense at the time. So I put it in the oven Christ. on broil. And then lit, 20 minutes later, oh, it's just, you know, I'm like bloody missed, like a pri- like a awarding pastry chef. You know, pull, I pull it out of the <laughs> oven and it looks glorious. Great British Bake Off, <laughs> sponsored by Tudor. Yeah. Uh, so but that wasn't the first way. You tried a few other methods before that. It wasn't. It wasn't just straight in the dial. You. You. I, I saw UV torches. I saw. Uh, yeah, I, well, I, I think I saw light cigarettes. I, oh, that's right. That's you're right. That's right. I forgot all that. Well, I put a UV torch against it because someone said that would work. That did nothing. Then someone was saying you've got to put the the dial in with cigarette smoke, and the nicotine will stain the loom. So I built this little box contraption and I, and I used to smoke like 25 years ago and i took it and i had to take a couple of huffs to kind of get it going i was like oh that's disgusting <laughs> now you smoke a pack a day <laughs> yeah, i'm back on a pack a day of gauloise without filters <laughs> so i stuffed those in there and nothing happened and then i ended that's how i ended up at the at the you're right at the, at the oven situation and then i had to do the hands and, so i put yeah. the hands and nothing was happening hands so i put them up much closer to the heating element and it kind of Boiled the loom out of the hands. <laughs> nice. So did then you, I had to go and find this friend of mine who re-loomed them. Did you have any regrets along the way? Like after after you've boiled the loom out of the hands, were you like, oh, push that a little too? <laughs> well, no, How's the warranty? It, <laughs> well, well, the final, I have to just say the final, because the th- here was the final thing for that watch, because I thought, because I've made this faux patina, why not give it a fake history? So I thought the final thing was because my dad was in the army in the 40s in the Second World War, I thought, why not imagine a world where this watch was issued in the 60s and this was his watch? So I put his name and serial number on the back of the watch. And then it made this, it just kind of completed it for me. And I really love it now. And when when Carla, Mm. my wife says, you know, well, I tell her, look, I made it into this thing that really matters to me now. Like there's an artistic journey that my dad's name is part of that fictional story. Um, so really, I really love it now. Yeah, and and so to 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 wrap out the the modifications, you you, you put the Dremel on the case as well, and the case is sort of has that warning look. You, you put it on a NATO strap, and, and I put the Dremel same. on the NATO as well. I really it looks, beat the shit out of the strap. Actually, it looks really um, cool. And I think aside from from watching you uh, destroy your wife's lovely present like that, uh, <laughs> what I found fascinating was was the um, the flow and effect that it had uh, to to the community, uh, obviously, you know, these, this went viral on, on Instagram, but people realized that if a guy like you can bake a dial and, you know, add this faux patina to it, 
That's what the professionals that, can do. Look how easy it is for, you know, professionals and, you know, well, dubious right, characters man. out there you're, you're, to, you're, you know. I mean, I was amazed how many people emailed me were just shocked that you could do yeah. that. And, and and as someone who collects old Rolex, I mean, that's part of the reason why I'm not interested in the mm. subs and all the rest of it. Because even when you talk to really, really, really good dealers, they say that they think like 70% of, of tropical Rolexes are just, you know, made up. Uh because it's it's easy to do that. Yeah, yeah. Our hour on uh, on the broil setting in the oven on high, and uh, yeah. You'll have a, <laughs> well, you'll have a I mean, that's the thing. Triple in value. That only that only made the loom tropical. I don't know how they do the dials, but I know this. But 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 oddly enough, I got a couple of emails from dealers going. So, uh, what oven setting were you? Uh... <laughs> hey, <laughs> I've got a, I've got yeah. another um, something else, sort of a little. I think a nice. Uh, uh, epilogue maybe to this story uh, and I don't know if it's one you've picked up on the you know the irony I don't think it's irony but at a similar time that you were doing this Tudor were would have been busy uh, doing some amazing uh, restoration on a watch that Hadinki featured that was actually a, a wartime worn Tudor bringing it back to as new condition are you aware of the, what, the watch no. I'm talking about? No. The long ride home, I think it was. It was a it was a um a Vietnam veteran who his watch took a bullet uh, to the side of the case, and oh, the guy yeah, who yeah, sort yeah. of saved his life took yeah. it and put it in his pocket. And then sort of the part one was they reunited him yeah, with the his medic. original watch yeah. thirty years later. But then part two was they sort of sent it off to Tudor to have a full sort of restoration, but not as you know your traditional restoration goes in terms of you know, this needs a new case and dial and hands. They sort of they repaired this the case bullet bent case it was amazing left 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 the history in there so it was sort of oh um, that's cool that's very, super cool two, yeah that two very that's different great. stories so that's yeah. a lovely so, story that's super cool it, i've got yeah, to say yeah, it, yeah, we'll link that look, up. it looks uh yeah probably cooler than yours no, no well, change, well i mean but... the, the history the history i mean the history is a that's an amazing piece of history yeah uh, yeah it's, it's really it's really great video you should definitely watch it yeah, I will. Thanks. Yeah, for that. that's amazing. Cool. All right. So, last bit of watch watch chat. I want to hear you know the Mister Enthusiasts picks for a few different price points on how to let the most out of your personality, how how to have the most fun, how to have the <laughs> the, the most quirk. So, I'm going to give you four price points. You've got five okay. grand, ten grand, twenty five, and fifty. Is this Aussie oh, dollars? Shit. US dollars? Pounds. US is fine. We'll keep it. US. We'll keep it in his okay. local currency. Right. He's, a, he's a he's a lovely American chap. Me? How dare you! Uh, so, so uh, don't overthink it. Should well, okay. five grand. So for five, what are you doing? Five grand. I would say. I'd say for five grand. I would say a couple of things. I'd say you can get amazing thirty-four millimeter Rolexes from the fifties that have incredible, unique dial designs that people don't buy because they're thirty-four mil and they're really beautiful. Um, or you can get. I would get like a. I would get a Seiko Jujaro from the eighties. Or I would cool. go for the P zero one. Um, Okay, uh, under 10. 10 grand. For 10 grand, I would I would either go for some Eberhardt pre extra fort from the 30s, which I've always been obsessed with, which are incredible design. Uh, they're 40 mil, so they're contemporary size and they're just amazing bits of kit. And you can get a decent one, maybe for eight or nine grand. Or I would go for 70s per tech um, because that's mm-hmm. just so. Once you kind of accustom your brain to that aesthetic, you realize how cool they are. Um, 25 grand was that the next one? Yep, yep, yep. Shit. 25. Um, Get actually, sorry, in the here. 10 grand, in the in the 25 or under, I would I would suggest a Rescence because I think they're really cool oh, wow. and yep. uh, cool. and I really love them and I, and I think that I think people uh, I don't know I just think that people don't kind of give them the the worth their worth that they're, they're just such interesting things, uh, and for 50. Shit, I getting guess. serious now. You get a lot yeah. of work. <laughs> it, it, well, I would go for Patek Beta 21 or I would go for Rolex Pre Daytona. I still think are really, really beautiful. And they're 36 mil. They're, you know, if you get a good one, they're beautiful mm. to wear. Um, you won't see many around. Um, what else? I think that, I guess, I think that's it. That's a solid list. It's a solid it's a list modern, of good options. Modern, old, a little bit of quirk. Not wasn't expecting quirky. the Rescence. Yeah. Was not expecting I, I the got, Rescence, I, I got a Rescence off eBay for cheap from a guy who was getting divorced. 
He met uh-huh. me in a Starbucks with his friend, a Ukrainian guy. It was all a bit weird. <laughs> but, the, but the what? what... Very yeah, cool. All 100%. right. Well, what we need to talk about is uh, your latest project, which has been in the works for a few months, uh, the Bastardo brand. So <laughs> you're releasing some products shortly. You've been teasing, uh, you know, big, big logos and, and key, key tags and hoodies and even work right. suits. Tell us about the brand. What does it stand for? What does it mean to you? Well, it's a bit of a long story, but I, I last year I bought a, a Lancia Delta Integrale, which, as you know, is a sort of a bit of a cult car. It's, uh-huh. a, it's a Group A, Group A rally car from the early, the very early nineties. Probably the most successful rally car. I mean, they won like I think six championships in a row or something. Um, and as I like I mentioned earlier, when I buy cars or watches, I you know I kind of have this deep respect for the thing. And I don't want to touch the thing because it's there's history in that thing and you don't want to kind of change the course of that history. Um, but this car was from Japan and it was this sort of hot rod car. It had been painted. It was it was full of like all these Fast and Furious gauges and, you know, like they had nice. this like sort of spongy knee brace on the driver's side for higher G lateral turns and all sorts of weird shit. It was fantastic, but it had been thoroughly molested. So I sort of call it the Bastardo car. Right, because it was sort of a bastard car, um, sure. and then when I got it, I thought, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna sort of because it's already been fiddled with. I'm gonna fiddle with it. Uh, so, so I painted it a a, a a a color that people haven't really seen that car in, um, and I put some wheels on it, and and then I and I renamed it Bastarda, and I changed the nameplate on the back to so the the same Lancia typography, but just it said Bastarda instead of Integrale. And it kind of went everywhere on the on the web, on Instagram, went pretty viral. Um, and then Magnus Walker did a video where he's driving it around New York. And and I and I so I before he did that, I did a line of I thought, you know, what? I'm just going to do a line of Lancia Bastardo keychains, just a quick run. Yeah. And, and, and I did them and they sold in like two weeks. Uh, and I thought, mm-hmm. you know what? I feel like maybe Bastardo is a brand. It could be a really good brand. Um, and it kind of grew in the in the pandemic. I really sort of took it seriously because, in some ways, it seemed like the perfect brand to to be born of from the sort of the the misery of the pandemic. Because the, the the logo mm-hmm. is an elephant, rampaging elephant, holding a broken bottle in its trunk. So sure. I thought, if there was ever a logo for twenty twenty, this is it. Mm-hmm. Um, so I started I started making stuff. So I've, I've got Bastardo sweatshirt. The brand is called Viva Bastardo. Um, which sort of means hooray for bastards, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> sure, sure. You know, as, yeah, <laughs> that's right. So I've been making, I made some Bastardo sweatshirts and some hoodies and the jumpsuit because I'm a bit of a jumpsuit fiend. Um, and the stuff's in production and I'm hoping in a month or so it'll be ready to go. I, I mean, I've never really done anything like this before. So who knows? I mean, people seem enthused and i get a fair amount of emails from people going when's the stuff ready i want to buy this i want to buy that which is really lovely that people are interested i mean of course there's a gap between saying i'm interested in an instagram message and actually coughing up money to buy something but we'll see yeah no that's cool it's really cool it looks um it looks like a v- very thoughtful in terms of, of the production um this episode is probably going to air in about a month so hopefully it's it's all it's all ready by then but we'll we'll link everything up that we can what do um senior Ralph Lauren models uh think of cars especially a boxy bizarre sort of uh you know like the like the Lancia you know <laughs> you're asking what I think of them yeah, as a senior yeah. Ralph Lauren underwear model, <laughs> as a senior that's, that's... Un- uh, Ralph Lauren uh, diaper model. We never said um, underwear. We never said underwear. <laughs> yeah, you're right. I mean, that was a bit. That was a bit. I was. I was Reach. really hoping for underwear, but I ended up with diapers. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, I mean, I've I, there's, I I kind of, I started off, I guess, in the traditional thing, you know, buying stuff from the Italian stuff from the '60s. Uh-huh. Uh, and 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 very beautiful kind of elegant stuff and and at some point i i guess i bought end up buying a bmw m1 and that sort of changed my whole obsession into i just got really obsessed with sort of boxy wheel flares group b homologation all that stuff from the 80s and again it was that it was that uh, it was actually not it was exactly i followed exactly the same path as, as i have done with watches in the sense that I looked at what everyone else was not looking at and no one is really paying attention to that stuff. And I looked mm. and thought, holy shit, you can buy 
uh, Lancia 037, of which they made 200. You get one for, you know, like a, a, a quarter of the pro, an eighth of the price of some of this other Italian stuff from the 60s. Why? And it's, mm-hmm. it's a competition car. Why would people not want this thing? Yeah, amazing. You live on, on Manhattan, but you, you own a few cars, right? And, and in, in the States. Yeah. <laughs> what do you have and where do you keep them? Well, actually, I sold most of them in the middle of the pandemic. Sure. Uh, I sold one actually transport. to a, guess, guess who, uh, guess one of the, what, this one guy bought the Lancer Delta S4. Guess he was a guy from New Zealand. Guess what he did for a living? He worked on Lord Cattle of the Farmer. Rings. No, no, no. He was selling PPE gear. Oh, God. Oh, wow. Okay. He's like, yeah, yeah, mate, I'm making money hand over fist. Jesus. Um, <laughs> in wow. I, 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 yeah, I mean, that was my New Zealand accent, which is probably yeah. nothing. I don't know what that was. I think, Andy, we just lost New Zealand. They did. <laughs> uh, <laughs> they're not listening the to it. They boycotted us. Um, <laughs> That's all right. Oh, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of ugly automobiles as well. Um, what do you like? Uh, Sorry to the well, guy in New Zealand who just bought this, you know, six-figure car. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, particularly, we were chatting a little bit about, I don't know what the, I've worked out they had a cool acronym, but uh, airport fire trucks. Oh, um, yeah, there's a super cool. Uh, there, I love there's that some kind sort of flat of, top. Yeah, yeah, but I'm I'm a very big fan of uh, super ugly heavy lift helicopters. Um, oh, yeah. The Russians make an amazing one. Um Shit, I can't remember the name of it now. You know what I'm talking about? Like you always oh, saw no, it like, I, in pictures. The, I think you're actually guess, thinking of the air crane, which is made by yeah, Sikorsky. that's right. That's actually yeah. American. It's an American company with a Russian name. Freaking, so Felix, yeah. you, you you like the the cross between ugly and utility, though. Yeah. I think that's the yeah. that's at the at the crux of your. Um, it wasn't a question because if it's really. ugly, if it's ugly, it feels like it really was. You uti- it was actually. It's utilitarian. Like if it's too pretty, you think ah, uh, it's not really utilitarian. They It'll got break designers tomorrow, on yeah. this, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. like Brilliant. that's kind of why the P the P zero one works for me because it's sort of ugly, but you think it feels like it's it was really made for something. Yeah, yeah. they haven't wasted money on on fancy you know marketing or design. It's yeah, just it's all like, gone into the it's product. It's a product of engineering, not design. That's right. That's sort of if yeah. if we made that's this look I, good, it would cost three times the price. Yeah, that's why I love. You know what I love is um, I love G wagons. Uh, from the yep. 80s, the, all the two-door G-Wagons from the 80s, and those, especially the ones that you can yes, buy. Yes, you have. Do you still have a G-Wagon? I never had a G-Wagon. I just would like one. If you <laughs> have a G-Wagon, get in touch. Well, that, <laughs> well that, was a bit, that was a conversation stopper, wasn't it? You guys had to sit down. <laughs> what, Phil? No G-Wagon? <laughs> you just, like, just hang up the phone. Hello? Hello, guys? <laughs> Uh, I've now lost Germany as well. <laughs> That's right. No, I, I, there's a you can get them for like ten grand, like used Swiss Army G wagons in the eighties with no mileage on them. Really? So, yeah, well, yeah. Why don't you have one? Because I, what I mean, I, I don't know. Like, what am I going to do with it? I mean, I guess I could say the same about <laughs> any car of her own, really. But <laughs> I'm sure you'll come up with something. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It would be a good apocalypse mobile. You've got all of these like tricky, mildly stressful um, logistics uh, <laughs> down pat. You've got the the transacting stuff sorted. You've got the mindset. You know, in terms of people who collect things, whether it's you know uh, pilots' helmets or cars or watches or you know really obscure, I don't know napkins. You have it figured out, and I'm curious if you have any advice for people who find the idea of you know getting this deep in a hobby uh stressful because as you mentioned pandemic kit you kind of cleared out a couple of cars like the ability to just kind of go all right shit's getting a little bit weird i'm gonna get out of these cars and move on and just sort of you you have all these balls in the air and how do you how do you keep them all sort of going (laughs) well i think for starters it's easier to clear out some shit if you have shit that's desirable well, I suppose I'm lucky in the sense that the, the distance between a, a, an idea in my mind and the idea being tangible is very short. Uh, I think uh-huh. you just have to, I don't know, and it, this is utterly, this is totally stupid, but you just have to get on with it. Like, it, it, and it's, and, and, and the things, are, I find most things are much easier than you think they are mm. to get anything so, done, like to, to do anything. So just take the pun. Yeah. And I find that generally, if you leap, this is, 
Here you go. Here's a here's a here's an embroidered throw pillow for you. If you leap, the net will appear. <laughs> That's good. No, I, I honestly the the thing throughout this chat is it's you, you're a guy who's you know who's got creativity um, by the boatload and and it's bursting at the seams and sort of the the mindset and this is what I've I've wanted to 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 really kind of talk about is you know you I, it, it's very clear that you see things differently to the way that I do and the way that even Felix does and and that that's not to say it's better or it's right or anything but the you know you you see p01 as an opportunity to to do something fun with it you see a car as a as a as an idea you see um art yeah. and ideas everywhere and I think that that's a really sort of special mindset to have when collecting things because you know you I, I dare say you don't see you know five pre Daytona, you know, cosmographs or pre cosmograph Daytona, sorry, and go, Oh, that's, I can have five of the best, uh, condition. You see that as, as something else. And it's the same with the beta 21s and, and all of this other stuff. So I, I, I'm curious just to how to, how to kind of replicate that sort of, um, well, I, I, I mean, and, well, I, well enjoyment. I mean, I guess, first of all, I'd say you have to, I think that collecting on Instagram is it, it, Instagram is such an interesting beast because it's dangerous in the sense that it exerts such an incredibly strong gravitational pull. So that mm -hmm. when everyone sees endless, you know, Rolex sub, Rolex sub, Rolex Daytona, Rolex Daytona, then, then after, it's, it's, it's like advertising. So after a while you go, you know what, I want one of those. Because you mm -hmm. can't resist the gravitational pull of the sameness that happens every day for the most part. So my first suggestion would be, if everyone's looking at steel sport Rolexes, look at let, think about what people aren't looking at so you have to kind of train yeah. your eye to not be you, so you have to look in the opposite direction and it may not necessarily be the right direction but it will always be an interesting direction because i think yeah. and then yeah. and then you have to sort of retrain your you have to train your because for instance when i started looking at 70s per tech it took me a while to kind of get past the oh this you've got this this you've got these prefabricated things in your mind 70s 1970s that's not so good 1970s Patek look it's kind of the weird shapes integrated bracelet what's all that about and your mind is rejecting the organ because you the implant because you've been raised on a on a diet of Rolex steel sports watches right so you're accustomed to that aesthetic so when you look at a totally different aesthetic your immediate reaction is to reject it but once you start looking yeah. at it and living with it and examining it, you begin to see, oh, this is really amazing. The craftsmanship's beautiful. They're really rare. They're not, they're not very expensive what they are. And then you begin to appreciate and then you, then you get obsessed <laughs> ultimately. So that's Fantastic. the thing to think is don't, don't look in the same direction as everyone else. I mean, that actually alarms me when people are all focused on one thing. Mm. Like, uh, you know, look, Nautiluses, for instance. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, th I think that's um, really, really good advice and a really fascinating way of, of looking at it. I'm glad, you know, that's that's why Andy wanted you sort of as a guest on this show. I had a, a slightly Despite different... your protest, Felix. Well, well no, I mean, <laughs> look, we... Not you know, you did get over. <laughs> well, God's I just sake, had one... <laughs> I had one question. Your one I... free pass for the year, Andy. Yeah. <laughs> right. Wow. I, I, I got you on um, on the premise that I could ask this one question. <laughs> Tell us about your spacesuit. The spacesuit. Oh, God. Okay, so ever since I was a kid, I, and I actually, I was a science fiction nerd overlord as a kid. And I, I read this book. Yeah, <laughs> I read this book by Robert Heinlein <laughs> called Have Spacesuit Real Travel. And sure. the, one of the things, and in the book, this kid buys a spacesuit and then he has, it opens up this whole world for him. And I'd always wanted to go into space. I was just, you know, obsessed with ast space astronauts and all, all of it. And I actually still have the Robert Heinlein book that I read as a teenager. So I always wanted the spacesuit as a kid. I wrote to NASA and said, could I buy a spacesuit? <laughs> you know, they sent me some brochures. Um, uh, so in the 90s, when Russia was breaking up, I was, I, and I was working in advertising, I would regularly, this is before Google existed, I would Yahoo yeah. search spacesuit for sale. <laughs> And I found this guy in Poland who was somehow connected with a guy in Russia who clearly had access to a shitload of amazing space stuff from some Russian museum that was, <laughs> the, uh, who, who knows what, like he'd either stolen it all, or who knows what. Perhaps also so, nuclear weapons. <laughs> yeah, I got that and I got a nuclear sub, uh, which was amazing. <laughs> That's in New Jersey. No one knows about that. Uh, so I, I emailed this guy back and forth for a year. I've sent him some money. It actually went into an escrow account. 
And then I got this box from Russia and inside was a spacesuit. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and it was really like, it was amazing. And they, and, and so of course, you know, the first thing you do is you want to get into it. Right. And it turns out <laughs> sure. the spacesuit is like for a guy who's like five foot two. Um, and I'm a towering five ten, so I couldn't. I mean, it's sort of. I sort of got half into it, and it's all rubber lined. So I was, but but it's just, it's it was my Custom dream. Fit. That was yeah, exactly. I chopped the legs. Uh, so that that's the that's the and it was all, it had always been my dream since I was a kid to get one, and I and I was lucky enough to have the money for. It. I mean, it was. I think I paid um, six grand for it. Do you know if it Which was, a, like, was there any, any information like that with it? Or? No, there's not none of it. I mean, no, I mean, record keeping wasn't that great in the nineties. I mean, it, look, I, mean, I don't think. I mean, the Russians have been making that particular suit since the eighties. I mean, they basically, yeah. you know, they just stick with the thing. So, sure, it's possible. I mean, it was either it was either flown or for training or or, or I mean, because they don't had I don't a, had a bit they, of musk to it. <laughs> there was a sort of yeah, there was a certain bit. vodkery musk to it. <laughs> Fear and vodka. <laughs> that's oh. right, man. That's the new, that's my that's the new bastardo perfume, by the way. Wow! <laughs> Just bottle it up. All right. <laughs> what we uh, what we like to do to wrap a show is we ask for recommendations, as you know. So for people that can't afford uh, Russian uh, re- retired space suits, we like to hear from our guests things that they have been watching, listening to, reading, um, consuming. So Phil, tell us consuming eating uh tell us tell us how you've been been killing the time what you've been enjoying uh well i learned how to make toad in the hole oh nice oh do you school. guys know it's big uh, here and it's yeah oh it's delicious we're a, co- we're, we're it, a colony yeah <laughs> yeah of course yeah it's amazing it's delicious so I, I learned how to make toad in the hole so i was making the wife and child toad in the hole on a regular basis till they said enough toad in the hole dad um I watched, um, I don't know if you guys have this yet on Netflix. Oh, no, is it Netflix or um, Raised by Wolves? Or is that oh, Amazon? Okay. Yeah, that's Netflix. That's the, the sci-fi one, yeah? Yeah. Netflix. Oh, that, that, well, there's two things I recommend on Netflix, Raised by Wolves and a show called Zero, 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 which is unbelievable about the cocaine trade and the directing is incredible and, and it's, it's across like three or four continents, but it's not a documentary. It's a drama and it's incredible. Uh, utterly incredible. It's all making sense. <laughs> Cocaine, <laughs> toad in the hole. You know, it's all coming together. Space suits. Space suits. Well, I uh, think I think um, G wagons. Uh, <laughs> I think that's good. I think that's as good a place to end it as anywhere. <laughs> but do you know what I like most about this interview, Andy? What? What's that, Felix? We haven't explained what toad in the hole is, and I don't think we should. <laughs> we'll link it up in the show you know, notes. Let I guess. people Google it. Let people Google it. <laughs> Amazing. Oh, well, Philip, uh, people can follow your Instagram, Mr. Enthusiast, or your sort of more work-focused Instagram, which is uh, your name that I don't have in front of me. Mr. Think, Toledana. It, Toledana. Mr. Toledana. Mr. Toledana. Mr. Yep. Toledana. On brand. Uh, we'll, we'll link up uh, v- Viva Basado as well for, for everyone, and, and we'll certainly be um, getting an order in for, for some bits and pieces. Thank you so much for, for joining the show. Um, guys, thank you so been, much. It was, a real, uh, it was a real joy to talk to you guys. It was a lot of fun. So thanks for having me on. Wow, Felix. What wow. a fun chat. What a guy. Inspiring and kind of in- intelligent. And also cheeky. I'd say cheeky. Hilarious. He's a hilarious man. That was a great, what a great interview. What a great guest. Uh, Thank don't you. think that's the last we're going to hear of Mr. Enthusiast and his antics. He'll surely be doing something wild. Um, we've got to get him some know, stickers for flippers. I reckon that would be his, uh, we could do a little stickers for El Bastardos. Yeah, we'll get him out there. All righty. So as always, thank you. Oh, well, before actually, before we do this, oh. here's the Halios bezel. Ready? Can you hear that? Mate, that's as, that's as smooth as a cat purring on a hot summer's day. Smooth like nut legs. Uh, that's a, ve- thank you that's this a week's vegan sponsor. butter substitute. Yeah, it is. Thank you to this week's sponsors, Longines. Thank you to our coffee sponsor, Inglewood Coffee Roasters. Do not forget to use our discount code OT30 at checkout for a big 30% off. We'll link up those codes. We'll link up the links to Longines. Felix, if someone wants to send us mails, how do they do it? They can send us mail at ot the podcast at gmail.com. And if they want to follow us on Insta, 
They should be already, but if they're not, they should go to ot.podcast uh, on Instagram. Also, thanks to Major Tom Media for producing the show. And if you like OT, support our sponsors. It's the best way to support us. Also, you can subscribe, tell your friends, tell your neighbours, tell your pets if they're sentient and uh, anyone else that might be listening. Tell them all. You know, do one of those things where you can get a satellite going out into space and beaming radios just for that uh, extra, you know, how you, you're so into getting different countries. What if we've got mm. Mars listening, Andy? I don't know that our uh, hosting software does. Yeah, different space station. Planets. That'd be cool. <laughs> yeah, ISS or something. All right. Ooh. Any astronauts listening to us? Hit us up. Bye.